How you doing, everybody? Corey Coleman here, and you know what I'm about to say. You know, this is uh, pretty popular. People who I've interviewed, they've come on and said, you know what? Whenever you say that you're doing something in the daytime, you're running a show in the daytime, that usually means that you're talking to somebody very special, and, of course, that is the case right here today. I am very privileged and honored to be talking to one of my favorite animators, somebody I followed over the years consistently, and that is Mr. Craig McCracken. How you doing, sir? Very good. How are you doing? I'm Thanks doing, for having me. Oh, no, no. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing to do this. I really uh, appreciate this, and I, I am really awestruck right now. I've, you know, <laughs> you're somebody that I've uh, watched and, uh, and seen their work over the years, and I just can't tell you how much it's my pleasure to be doing this right now. Congratulations on your new show, by the way, Co mm -hmm. uh, Kid <laughs> Cosmic. We're really excited about it, yeah. Yeah, this is a show that's going to be on Netflix. It already is on uh, Netflix at the moment. You can go and watch it. Uh, we're going to be talking about this a little bit more, but since we don't have a whole, whole lot of time with Mr. McCracken over here, we're just going to go ahead and jump into the interview. And one of the things that uh, I've always wanted to talk to you about, if I ever did meet you, which is today, you mm -hmm. have, of course, a very distinct style. I even remember back in the day watching uh, Dumb and Dumber, the cartoon. Mm -hmm. And when Powerpuff Girls came on, I said that that style reminds me of uh, the guy that are the people that did Dumb and Dumber. And mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, uh, later on, you know, because you have such a distinct style later on, you did a uh, 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 Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. I'm going to show a little bit of this so people can see the art style that I'm talking about. <laughs> What I like about that style is that it's a, it's, it seems like a sketchier type of style, something that you've uh, actually applied to uh, Kid Cosmic here. What was your, uh, what were your influences as you were coming up? Uh, well, I just grew up with cartoons and I love uh, cartoon iconography and uh, I've just been drawing my whole life. I've been drawing since I was about three or four years old and I just love you know, cartoon images and stuff. Mm -hmm. So just everything that was on TV when I was a kid was definitely an influence. But uh, for Kid Cosmic, the thing that's really influenced this show was more like print cartoonists because Kid Cosmic is sort of set in reality, right? These aren't cartoon characters. These are real people. So I wanted to kind of figure out a way to make it feel tactile and believable, but caricature in a way that still was somewhat cartoony. So I looked at... Um, uh, Hergé, who did Tintin, which I grew up with, and I love those Tintin oh. adventure books. And so those stories, like, they felt like they were in the real world and tactile, but they also were kind of cartoon and caricatured. So we sort of, like, looked to that for how to at least do the design style with, with Kid Cosmic. You know, with uh, Kid Cosmic, this is a, a superhero show. And, you know, I'm going to show a little bit of a clip right here of Kid Cosmic so people can get a better idea of what they're looking at if you haven't seen this before. Of course, it's, uh, you know, it's, like it's centered towards more kids and it's, it's very whimsical and it's comedic, but it's still a superhero show. I'm going to form a team of the best heroes on Earth. Oh, that's so creepy, but so cool. You know, admittedly, I have not seen this yet, but I don't mind saying that because I, I'm dying to see this now. I've been, I've been waiting for this for a while. Uh, but with so many superhero properties that are that are out there uh when you were going into this what made you feel like this would stand out well what we really wanted to do was the whole theme of the show is fantasy versus reality right so it's this young kid who like a lot of kids fantasizes about being a hero and i was like well what would that happen if that happened to a real kid like and a lot of kids would have this supreme confidence like oh yeah i'll get my powers i'll be great i'll be amazing i'll be able to save the day <laughs> and it'll be perfect right but it's not gonna happen like that. So I wanted to just kind of tell that story, like the struggle that the kid would have to go through. And you know, you watch a lot of superhero movies, there's always like a quick montage in the middle when they first mm -hmm. get their powers and they're really bad. And to me, that's like the most human moment and the most funny moment and the most relatable moment. And I was like, well, let's just make a series about that period of time where you're, you're not good and you're struggling and it's hard for you and it's not like it is in the comic books and the movies. And, and let the kid learn what it really is about being a hero. And like the theme of the show is heroes help not hurt. So it's not about, ultimately it's not about beating up bad guys and, and just winning because you're stronger. It's about being compassionate and caring and 
helping other people in need. Actually, more of a human story underneath all the superpower stuff. Yeah, we always say it's more about the people than the powers. So it's it was it's definitely a character story about these this small town and these these uh, uh, these team members on this. That's great. I always thought that that was what worked best with uh, fantastical or superhero stories. If you really sit on the character and make them more human before you really get into the crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you went to Cal Arts. Mm -hmm. And you were classmates, and I'm going to show a picture of them right here. You were classmates with somebody else that people know very well, uh, Gindy Tartakovsky. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you collaborated with him on many things. Uh, he, of course, he's the creator of Dexter's Laboratory. I think you worked with him on Two Stupid Dogs. I'm sure you guys have done a lot of other things together. Uh, you're, you know, you're legends in uh, the animation industry. Do you still keep up with them? Uh, yeah, Gany and I see each other from time to time, but we were, when we went to CalArts, uh, myself, Gandhi Tarkovsky, and, and Rob, we were like the three guys that were really into cartooning stuff. You know, there's a lot of people in my class, but a lot of them were very interested in becoming Disney animators. So Gandhi, Rob, and I just sort of found each other because we really loved classic cartoons and uh, uh, funny cartoons, and we just developed kind of a working creative relationship uh, in those early days. Um, and when I got my first job uh, at Hanna-Barbera on a show called Two Stupid Dogs, uh, Donovan Cook, who was the producer, said, hey, do you know anybody else who'd be good for boards? And I go, oh, yeah, my friends Robin and Gendy are fantastic. So they got the job on Two Stupid Dogs. And then we just started working and collaborating together, uh, you know, in those early days. And, you know, Gendy was a huge part of uh, the success of Powerpuff Girls. Um, and so, you know, I was... Uh, he is sort of number two storyboard artist and uh, art director on Dexter's Laboratory. And we did four seasons of that. And then when Powerpuff got uh, picked up, we sort of switched hats and I became the, the showrunner and Gendy was my number two and was, like I said, instrumental in, in, in the success and quality of that show, for sure. Yeah, it's funny that you talk about how when people went to CalArts, they wanted to be Disney animators. And because I remember, you know, I'm old enough to Remember, like, if you were into animation, everybody was like, CalArts, CalArts, that's the place you got to be, and that's the place you wanted to go if you were at Disney. This is going to come up later on. We're not going to talk about it now, but I think that you might have, you and a few others might have changed the course of that uh, mm -hmm. to a point where it's even created somewhat of a controversy today, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, were there anybody uh, or any other people that you went to CalArts with that, have gone on to make big names for themselves? Um, we were in a class with uh, Sergio Pablos, who went on to uh, do great things in features. He was involved in uh, the Despicable Me franchise, but most recently he produced uh, Klaus for Netflix yeah. that came out a few years ago that was just an absolutely stunningly beautiful 2D animated film, but looked like it was 3D. It was just absolutely groundbreaking and, and Sergio uh, was on our class. Yeah, um, I talked to, uh, it was funny, I talked, to, I talked to him, I did an interview with him like maybe a couple of days before he got the news that they were nominated for Best Animated Picture mm -hmm. at the Oscars. That, you know, that was a big moment. He was like, yeah, well, we hope we get it, you know, but we, you know, there's a lot of competition and then we saw the video where everybody was cheering when they got it. That was a real mm -hmm. cool moment to have right before that happened. You know, speaking mm -hmm. of collaborations, uh, one of my favorite art projects and musical projects has been gorillas mm -hmm. and watching powerpuff girls there have been a lot of visual easter eggs connecting powerpuff girls to gorillas like i don't know you know in the same universe or whatever but you know here's some things that, you, that i'm looking at right now you know and uh there's an episode where in the back of a newspaper they're, they're advertising mm -hmm. the gorillas live you know i remember watching powerpuff girls and seeing a guy wearing a gorilla shirt um uh, uh, uh 2d's wearing mojo jojo uh mm -hmm. on his shirt um even to the point where you know just recently about two years ago ace from the gangrene game actually joined the gorillas he replaced right. murdoch as the i believe as the, as the basis of the group uh of course he's the green guy right there for people looking uh are you friends with the co-creator of the gorillas jamie hewlett how did they, or is this an intentional thing do you know him very much and you've always wanted to collaborate with him how's this happening 
Well, I'm a huge fan of Jamie's work and we sort of know each other a little bit. We've met a couple of times, but we sort of have a mutual admiration society. He was a big fan of Powerpuff Girls. And when Gorillaz first came out, I saw that image with 2D wearing the Mojo shirt. And I'm like, whoa, Jamie's a fan. <laughs> so when we were doing the Powerpuff movie, it kind of Warner Brothers brought up like, hey, we'd like to get a band to do a song for the end credits. And I'm like, well, why don't we get the Gorillaz? Because... They're called the gorillas, and the movie is about an army of, you know, evil <laughs> chimps and monkeys attacking Townsville, and they're an animated band. It's a perfect collaboration. So we reached out to them, and they were interested in it. And, you know, uh, my wife, uh, Lauren Faust, and I got to go to their show when they were in L.A., and we met Jamie and Damon, and we were talking about the possibility of them doing it, but the, the schedule just couldn't work out. We couldn't make it happen. So, like, I put little Easter eggs of, of their stuff in in uh in powerpuff um and then out of nowhere just a couple of years ago jamie got a hold of me again and said hey would you be cool if ace joined the gorillas while we're <laughs> to jail? and i'm like absolutely i said it's not my decision i don't own those characters but you know you have to talk to cartoon network legal but they were cool with it and i wasn't involved in it it just happened and it was it's honestly one of the most exciting things that ever happened. I'm just like, I'm so honored to be a part of that because he's just an absolutely incredible draftsman and artist. And I, I respect his stuff so much. Yeah, that came out of nowhere. And that surprised the hell out of me, man. I mean, it was a very exciting moment. I was like, you know, these two things that I love uh, all together right here. And I was always wondering at some point down the line, if there would be an actual collaboration because of all of the little Easter eggs that would drop. So that was a really cool moment that happened right there. Also, you know, speaking of following you, I remember going late nights to Spike and Mike's Animation Festival, Sick and Twisted Animation Festival. And you know what I'm going to bring up. I don't know if a lot of yeah. uh, the younger people out there know this, but I remember seeing uh, your shorts for this creation right here. No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, now this is a particular episode. I'm not, I can't even show what was going on in this completely there's uh with this uh this particular episode uh you did uh it was very adult it had you know it dealt with uh no neck joe trying to uh get with some girls and his friends are actually making him look bad and it just happens you can probably tell with this ghost since he doesn't have a neck he also has another actually a couple of uh, other appendages that he could use to attract these girls and it ends with uh, a very adult joke right there. Uh, love No Neck Joe, but have you thought about, you know, because of, you know, a lot of stuff you've done has been, you know, family friendly or kid centric. Have you had any ideas or thought about going back into doing something that's more adult in animation? Well, originally No Neck Joe's were my student films from Cal Arts. And uh, I haven't seen the one you're speaking of because I had actually no involvement in that. I think Spike and Mike went on and made some No Neck Joe's without my permission. <laughs> so this is the first time hearing that, that something like that exists. Those original No Neck Joe's were pretty innocent and silly, and I made as Cal Art student films. So, you know, I think they may have gone on and done some independent things. <laughs> Uh, well, you own. know what? I hate to be the one to break it to you. If yeah. you go, go online, man, and there's a very nasty joke at, at the end of one of those no-neck Joes, man. And I, you know, it's not mine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for clearing that up, man. Because I always <laughs> thought, like, all right, this is, and if you, and even, I maybe mean, you, you should check it out because even in the comment section, people are like, "Oh, Craig, you can you, you nasty <laughs> boy." <laughs> nope. Yeah. No, I'm clean. I'm innocent. I didn't do any of those. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good to hear, man. Good to hear. Because oh, I always thought, like, he has a nasty streak in him. It's nice mm. to hear that you're a nice, you're a nice lad. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but you know, even then, well, even at the time before uh, Powerpuff Girls became Powerpuff Girls, they were known as uh, Whoop Ass Stew. Yeah, the Whoop Ass Girls. Yeah. Yeah, the Whoop. Yeah, the Whoop Ass Girls. And I think even the title comes up in a little bit, and it, and it says "whoop ass" on there. Uh, yeah, there you go, the <laughs> whoop ass stew. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you, again, even that is not that that offensive, or it's not that you know mature or anything. It just has "ass" in the title. But have you thought about ever since you know? Because even Gendy Tartakovsky, you know, he he's gone on to do things like uh, uh, Primal 
And have you thought about doing something that might be a little more adult or mature? Uh, my brain's just not wired that way. I don't think of those types of things. I don't have like an adult animated series in my mind that I've been secretly wanting to do for a long time. I just, my, my natural instincts for creating, I tap into what I was like as a kid. So uh, it's, it's all pretty, you know, family friendly, fair stuff that I tend to do and get excited about. And whoop ass originally, the reason it's called whoop ass because it was originally sugar spice, everything nice, and an accidental can of whoop ass, which is, you know, <laughs> a real thing. And when we were first doing the first short at Cartoon Network, we actually recorded it with whoop ass girls. And Cartoon Network was like, we were moving forward with making it. And Mike Lazo, I think, was in a meeting with, uh, you know, cable buyers or different cable affiliates and saying like, oh, we're working on this short called the whoop ass girls. And they were like, wait, what? You're calling it what? And so it kind of got shut down and they called me and said, I think you're going to have to change the name. And I'm like, all right, I was waiting for that to happen. But, you know, yeah, originally they were the Whoop Ass Girls. And okay. in my heart, they're still the Whoop Ass Girls because that's, that's what they do. And that's about as nasty as you'll get as your mind works right there. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> you know, continuing with the Powerpuff Girls, I remember when the Powerpuff Girls movie came out, uh, years ago uh a lot of people i don't know again i don't know if a lot of people even remember the powerpuff girls movie because at least today because at the time and, and when this came out i remember waiting on this and that the year that that came out that was actually one of my favorite movies not because i was even a big fan of the powerpuff girls it was just a really hilarious film man and one of the best films that stood out that year thank you hi what's your name ah! Powerpuff Girls movie. Now, the thing with this movie is that, and I'm, you know, I don't want to bring up anything bad, but I was surprised to see how much the movie, or how, how you know, I don't want to put it in a negative way, but it bombed at the box office. Oh at yeah. The time yeah, and, yeah. and and and, but critics loved it, man. When they saw it, it got a lot of praise. What happened with the film to where it was such a successful series, but did so poorly at the theaters? Well, I don't know what really caused that. The, totally, the movie's very different than the show, right? The show is very colorful and fun and campy and silly, and the movie's a lot more intense. Um, I think maybe a lot of it uh, was, I think a lot of our fans maybe were afraid to go see it, because when we actually got our ratings and looked at the viewership for Powerpuff Girls, we had a lot of boys who watched Powerpuff Girls as the mm -hmm. show and loved it because of the acting and everything. But I think they may have been a little embarrassed to go to the theater and say, I want a ticket for the uh, Power Girls and didn't go and maybe waited till it came on video or whatever. But yeah, it, did, it didn't do what they were hoping it for it to do. Um, but, you know, it was, yeah. it was, the, you know, it was a lot of work and I'm proud we got to do it and produce that film. No, it's, I mean, it's a great movie, man. I mean, so did it actually do better when it came out on video? I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure what uh, the the the, um, the success of it was afterwards, but it, it was just a different thing. I it, I think Cartoon Network. I think maybe thought I was going to make something very kind of pink and silly and colorful and and uh, uh, you know just more uh, light and it, you know it was a pretty intense action movie. And that's sort of what I was encouraged to do when we were starting it. It was like. I, 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 I did get some directive saying, I want you to make this movie for 25 year old guys. So, and I was like, really? Okay. And it was a little bit of us trying to reclaim the heart of Powerpuff Girls, where once Powerpuff really blew up, all the toys in the marketplace were very pink and colorful. They even had like makeup kits and jewelry kits and mm -hmm. things that really had nothing to do with superheroes and saving the day and fighting crime. So I, we used the movie to try to reclaim that aspect of Powerpuff, like, no, these are heroes and they save the day and they're in danger and they fight and it's an action story. So I think uh, maybe some of the fans were like turned off a little bit by the intensity of that. Uh, and the marketing kind of marginalized, marginalized it like sort of uh, a more de demographic for girls out there. And, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, before I, we move on, I just have to say, man, that's a cozy ass room you got right there. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Yeah. Just all my stuff, my generation stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, I got to do my room like that, man. That's the kind of room that makes you want to stay in there and work. Do you do you find yourself working a lot? Do you balance your uh, your work life and your home life out pretty well? 
Uh, as much as I can. I've got a four-year-old daughter now, so it's I, I now have to, you know, balance it a lot better. You know, I, I used to like work all through the days, work all through the weekends, but since I became a father, it's like no. When the day, you know, when the day's over, I'm spending the time with my daughter and my wife and my family. And weekends are off limits. I don't work on weekends anymore. So yeah, it's I'm I'm doing a better job at balancing it. Well. <laughs> yeah. When you say you're doing a better job, it's almost like people are kind of coercing you to like get away from the desk and you know spend time with the family now. No one's really coercing me other than my own desire to do it. Other than like yeah. I want to spend time with my daughter and my wife and my family. I'm mean, like you know. Has uh, you, having a daughter, you know, with everything that you're doing, you talk about how, you know, the way your mind works, it is in a more family friendly way. Has your daughter kind of added some inspiration to what you're doing now? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm watching a lot more preschool shows than I ever did. And I'm finding ones that are, wow, these are really great. These are really fantastic and inspiring shows. My, my daughter just discovered the Powerpuff Girls because we have some statues in our house. And she was trying to play with them. And I'm like, well, no, no, don't play with those. Here's some action figures. So she was playing with the figures and wanted to know what they were about. So I put the main title on for her. And she watched it at least 20 times in a row. And then at a certain point, she went, they're kids, but they're superheroes, but they're kids. And I could just see the wheels turning in her mind and just like it dawning on her what amazing thing that was. And she was in her class this morning her zoom class and she brought out the golden book i drew and wrote and was like telling her teacher about it and saying she calls mojo mojo joe and she's like mojo joe's the bad guy and these are the powerful girls and i'm like this is great oh this, this is, is awesome great. man <laughs> yeah and i don't like we don't say like oh daddy mommy made that we don't say that we're just like oh this is great that you like this thing thank you got a, a little artist on your hand coming up uh we definitely uh, she's got a huge imagination for sure, and she draws a lot, and she, she'll make up characters out of whatever thing she's holding in her hand. It doesn't matter what it is. It, it, you know, it can be like a big spoon and a small spoon, and that becomes a mom and a baby and creates stories with them or whatever. <laughs> and, and she's always telling my wife and I, like, go over here or color this or do this or draw this or do this. So we call her the director. Because she's <laughs> constantly directing us to do whatever plan she has in her mind. So chances are you have a creative of some sort on your hands. I think so. Yeah, and everything she says, she makes up songs about. Like everything she's playing, she's making up a song about. Oh, that's we just awesome, wish, man. We wish we could get her in, you know, music classes or dance classes or something. They're like, oh, we're, we're all stuck at home right now. It's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. See, you're the kind of guy that makes a dude want to go out and be a father, man. You mm -hmm. know, you, you sell it well. You sell it very well. Uh, I know we have to wrap things up pretty soon, so I'm going to bring back something I talked about earlier. And, you know, we were talking about CalArts mm -hmm. and how back in the day when people went to CalArts, chances are they wanted to go work for Disney. And that was the art style they were trying to learn. They were trying to do things the Disney way. You know, I think you and a few other people kind of came in and changed the course of that to the point now where it's even a little controversial. They have this thing now, more than ever, Cal Arts is known to people and known to viewers out there who watch animated shows. And it's called the Cal Arts style. You know, it's mm -hmm. things that people have seen with like Gravity Falls and Steven Universe, Gumball. You know, we're looking at a few things right here. Um, it's become controversial because they say now that they're applying this style to things that people, they feel like it shouldn't be applied to. Things like Thundercats that's come up and she and things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. And other people are saying, hey, look, it's just a style. Things go in waves. They happen just like everything else. You know, what's your opinion on this whole controversy of the CalArts style? Well, there, there never was a CalArts style. When we, when we were at working at CalArts, there was never like, all right, this is the way you need to draw to fit the CalArts style. We were just drawing the way we were drawing. Um, and one of the reasons, you know, I developed that style is I just like graphic design. But, you know, animation production is incredibly time consuming and difficult. And so that style that we use for Dexter's and Powerpuff was looking back to early television cartoons like Hanna-Barbera um, and even uh, some more artistic uh, studios like UPA and Hanna-Barbera designed that style of uh, cartoon making because you could get it done on a production schedule that was shorter 
than say the production schedules they would have done in the 40s when they were doing either Tom and Jerry or Looney Tunes cartoons. You know, you had to go faster. So that kind of simplified design style was really just done for practicality reasons. So we could generate the shows quicker on the, the, the time and budget we had. And I think other people saw that and went, wow, that's working really, really well. And so they've just kind of tried to emulate it uh, themselves and just apply it to other shows. But I, I think a lot of it just comes down to, you know, it's easier to make shows with that simpler drawing style. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I said, I never I, I never thought that there was a particular style If anything. I thought that things just happen. They evolve and then they go on to evolve to something else. You know, it's just where it is right now. Um, yeah. Each generation is inspired by the next generation that follows it. And we all sort of feed off each other's work and kind of improve upon it and keep it moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly, man. And honestly, a lot of the new shows that I see, I see way more influence from Simpsons than, say, the so-called Cal Art style. I mean, this. There's a whole generation of kids that th the coolest cartoon for them were The Simpsons. You know, that yeah. was the thing they were definitely looking at. You know, I noticed, it's funny, I noticed that is Simpsons, and I noticed that there's another generation that's completely influenced by anime. And they oh, brought yeah. that into their work. You know, mm -hmm. to the point where, you know, it was so funny to me to see black culture adopt anime style to where it's like you see it in the boondocks now and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, things just uh, just a different. Um, well, again, I know that, uh, you know, we had about 30 minutes together. I think we're about to wrap things up. This has been a, I could talk to you all day about, you know, just animation <laughs> alone, man. But, you know, this has been, um, for one, it's been very educational. I've learned about some things that you have done, expanded on that, and how some of my favorite things have happened. I learned about some things that you have not done. Uh, you know, yes, <laughs> me too. Yeah. <laughs> man, yeah. definitely go look that No Neck Joe up. I mean, you know, this is, this is nasty, man. You might, you might want to clear that up with people. Go in there and tell people, like, I had yeah. nothing to do with this. But thank yep. you so much, man, and congratulations <laughs> on everything uh, that's going on. Hey, you know, let me ask you one more thing, because um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very curious about this. How... How is it pitching the show and getting the show done today compared to when you were first starting out, like with the Powerpuff Girls and before that? Can you can, not just your Craig McCracken? Can you go into a room and just say, "Hey, look, trust me, give me some money, we can do this." And people are like, "Oh yeah, sure, whatever you want to do." Yeah, I've kind of earned that where I can do it, but I I, I always like showing an example of what I I want to do because a lot of times when you're pitching a show to somebody you're at the mercy of them making the show in their own head. And I don't want anybody saying no to my project because of the version of it they're making in their head. So I always try to have something tactile I can show them, whether it's a little, some pages from a graphic novel or an animatic of something where I can go like, I have this idea, but watch it. And that's how I pitched Kid Cosmic to Netflix. I just went in and said, I hit play. And I said, I'd like to make more of this because I had a 22 minute animatic for the pilot. So that's always helpful because, you know, I remember when we were pitching Fosters, I had a room full of artwork and this is what I wanted to do with it. And I remember somebody who was uh, in the pitch said like, oh, they've all been abandoned and they're looking for new homes. That feels really sad. It feels like Island of Misfit Toys. And so they were making a sad version of the show in their head. But fortunately, somebody who I'd worked with for years went, this is Craig. He doesn't do that. It's not going to be that way. <laughs> and so they knew my work and I could kind of dodge that, that concern, you know, it just disappeared immediately. But um, yeah, I always try to have something tactile to show. I think that's really important. I think that's cool to hear too, man. I always like for people to walk away from these interviews, learning something, especially if they want to get into entertainment, animation, especially, uh, I know they have the show Bible out there that, you know, for anybody doesn't know, have a show Bible if you want to pitch an animated show. But uh, you, what you're saying is it definitely is good to have visuals, several visuals of some kind, if you're going in and pitching a show to, to, to people. So, yeah. well, again, man, congratulations on earning that right to walk in and say, hey, make it. <laughs> you know? yeah, right. And nice. uh, and I, I really appreciate it. And congratulations on being a father, man. Those were really Thank cool you. stories to hear about you and your daughter. I'm yeah, going to make a baby you. right now, man, because he is yeah, so, well, it's amazing. It's what's great. that? It's amazing. It's great. It's really wonderful. Yeah. No, it's good to hear, man. Congratulations on everything. And thank you for the interview. This has been, this has been awesome. And I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Boy. I appreciate it. Thanks. That was so amazing to be able to talk to him. I really have followed that, that guy's work for years and 
this is one of the benefits of doing this, being able to talk to people that you just love. And at one time you thought you'd never speak to, but you do. So with that said, we'll leave this on a very positive note. Also, speaking of notes, send me one. You know what to do. Even when I'm not streaming, you can reach me anytime. Just pull out that keyboard and type in kcoolmans at gmail.com. That's K-C-O-O-L-M-A-N-Z at gmail.com. You email us with any kind of questions, comments, compliments, insults, input, and our advice. Hit us up on the social medias, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Type all that information down right there. Jot it down. Memorize it. Love it. Most importantly, use it. And if you plan on coming to Austin, Texas, because we do love to see the Toasties out there, just don't do it now. You know, we love you, Toasties, so much we don't want you to die. And you know Big Ronnie is out there. So when the time is right, let us know what your plans are for Austin. Email us kcoolmans at gmail.com. Let us know when it's safe. If you are moving here or just simply passing through. Because we'd love to safely, did I emphasize safely? We'd love to safely hang out with you. All right, everybody, that is it. Again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to do what we do, like what we did today and talking to these real extraordinary people. We'll see you on the next one, whatever that is, wherever that is. Good night, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever you are listening to or watching this, goodbye and stay. Toasty.